Infrared spectroscopy, along with mass spectroscopy and NMR, form three methods of analyzing and determining the structure of organic molecules. To understand how they work, let's begin by looking at the electromagnetic spectrum. When you subject matter to different forms of the electromagnetic spectrum, it behaves differently. Let's begin at the UV invisible part of the spectrum. Matter, when subjected to UV light or visible light, will cause the electrons to transition or move from one orbit to the other. We saw this earlier in the course when we looked at flame colors or the line spectrum of hydrogen. Infrared radiation, the subject of today's talk, it causes certain covalent bonds to vibrate. Microwaves will cause molecules to rotate more quickly. And when matter absorbs radio waves, it can cause particles in the nucleus to essentially spin in the other direction. This is the basis of NMR. Now back to infrared, today's topic. We define the wave number of the number of waves that would fit into a single centimeter. So I'm going to take one centimeter and divide it by the wavelength of a typical infrared radiation. For here, I'm choosing 10 to the minus 6 meters. That would generate a wave number of 10,000. Here we can see how the wave number is affected by the wavelength. But what I would like you to note in this is as the wave number increases, the amount of energy increases. So remember that increasing wave number means increasing energy. Now, as mentioned earlier, only certain vibrations essentially absorb infrared radiation. Not all bonds will. Let's begin by looking at a polar molecule. This might be something like HCl. Diatomic molecules are only capable of stretching the bond that exists between them. And here we can see as they vibrate and move back and forth, we can see a movement of the poles. Here's a second molecule with a weaker bond or a larger partner, maybe something like HBr. It would vibrate more slowly back and forth. Both of these bonds, however, have moving dipoles. The dipoles change position and as a result are infrared detectable and can absorb infrared radiation. There would be a difference though in the energy they would absorb. My faster vibrating pair would require 286, whereas my slower vibrating pair, 2,559. Let's look at a polyatomic situation where we put three atoms together, it's, say something like water. These molecules are capable of both stretching and bending. Here we have the two hydrogens in water moving away simultaneously in what we call a symmetric stretch. As you could see, the poles moved and this would be infrared detectable. Let's look at a second stretch, which is asymmetrical. And again, we can see a movement of the poles. So this bond would also be infrared detectable. Now I'm going to have those hydrogens bend in and out. And again, we have a movement of the poles and such a vibration would absorb infrared radiation and be infrared detectable. So we can see here in all these cases with polar molecules, we tend to get vibrations or bending that are detectable and can be absorbed infrared radiation. Let's look at a nonpolar situation, perhaps H2 or Cl2. When these molecules vibrate, because they're not polar, we don't have any poles that move. And as such, they're not infrared detectable. Here's another molecule that's not polar, but does possess polar bonds, carbon dioxide. In this case, I've shown the location of the center of positive charge and the center of the negative charge. Both oxygens in this case would be negative. So what I've shown here in blue is where the center of their charge resides. If carbon dioxide undergoes a symmetrical stretch, that pole doesn't move. And as such, a vibration like this would not absorb infrared radiation. If, however, we get an asymmetric stretch of our oxygens, this does move to the negative pole, and this would absorb infrared radiation. And finally, let's look at the bending. And again, we can see a movement of that negative pole so a bending motion would absorb infrared radiation. Now let's look at how the, the test works. We begin with our sample and we illuminate it with infrared radiation, a wide range of infrared radiation going from wave numbers of 10,000 down to 100. 
as it shines through that sample, bonds in the sample will absorb certain wavelengths. And as a result, certain wavelengths or certain energies will be removed. So portions will pass through virtually unaffected, and you'll also have portions that absorb radiation. This would appear in a trace shown below, where the wave number corresponds to the various energies of light. What we're particularly interested in are the large valleys, places where energy is absorbed, and I've marked two of them here on this graph. So I'll write those off to the side here. We have a broad band between about 2,500 and 3,300, and another narrow band at about 1,700. By consulting our IB data booklet, we can see that those values correspond to certain types of bonds or functional groups. I can see the broad band corresponds to the OH bond that's present in carboxylic acids. And also that 1730 corresponds to a carbonyl group. That would lend me to believe that this is a carboxylic acid in that sample. To further justify which carboxylic acid it might be, I take a look at what's called the fingerprint range, which ranges from about 1500 down to about 500. That particular part of the spectrum is characteristic for each molecule, and by consulting a library, I might be able to determine which one it actually is. So I hope you found that interesting, and remember we've got a couple more programs to look at on how to analyze spectra.